Hi! So my name is Charlotte Carbone, some relationship to Mark Carbone. I am a fourth year student at Ryerson University for Fashion Design, and I just came back from a five week trip to Korea and Japan. While I was there, of course there was culture shock, but more interestingly enough, was seeing how technology was integrated into the workforce at a very basic level, which is part of everyday life. So, firstly, something that was common when you went to big department stores, such as our equivalent to, let's say, the Bay or an Honest Ed's if you've ever been to Toronto, you enter and there are humanoid robots called Pepper, and they are AI, so as soon as you go in, instead of a greeter, it would be a robot where you can select your language and communicate to it verbally, and it will redirect you to whatever you may be looking for. It may be simple as you're looking for a certain item or you need to talk to a person, but either way, this robot has replaced a human job that has done it more efficiently, potentially, because it can speak so many different languages. And of course, it does have the personal touch that if you do need a human, you can go select to talk to one, but it just increased the efficiency with these robots, and they're pretty standard as well across Japan. Another thing that I found pretty typical in Korea and Japan were the use of kiosks as well. Typically when you go to something such as a subway, there is maybe only one collector, but the rest are all automatic gates that you use a preloaded card of the system to tap in and out of. To reload the card with money, same thing, you use a kiosk to insert money into. There is little to no human interaction unless you need to troubleshoot something if there's an issue. Same with when you go to eat at a restaurant. Particularly in Japan, you'll typically go to a vending machine, select what you want on the buttons, insert money, and you get an order sheet that you give to the chef personally yourself. So instead of having a waitress, this vending machine greets you automatically and you do everything self-service. Something unique to Japan in terms of the food, the restaurants, was kaiten sushi, which is bullet train sushi. So in Canada it is here, the all you can eat sushi would order from an iPad and it's brought directly to you, but Japan takes it to next level when the sushi is delivered by motorized little vehicle around the restaurant. So imagine, you go into a restaurant, you're assigned a seat number, and while you sit there, you order an iPad, and then there's a racetrack that races around the restaurant. And when you order, because everything has been assigned a number, you say send a shrimp roll to table 47. And the shrimp roll knows where table 47 is, so it comes speeding along this track, it stops in front of you, you confirm on the screen that you received it, you take it off, and then the little cart, it zooms back to the kitchen. So, you don't even need to talk to a person to go and order your food. Unrelated to my trip to Korea and Japan, I've been reading this book called Cradle to Cradle. The concept of Cradle to Cradle is taking materials that are used to make goods, and they are in an endless loop. They're constantly recycled into new ones. Currently our cycle is from cradle to grave, meaning that what we make will eventually end up in the grave, the dump. August 2nd was a significant day to do with cradle to cradle, because on August 2nd was Earth Overshoot Day. Earth Overshoot Day is when we have used up one year of the Earth's resources, what it can provide us. In 1971, when this day was first calculated, it was only at December 21st, meaning we'd only messed up about 10 days of our Earth, whatever time here with the Earth's resources. However, because we stopped on August 2nd, that means we've missed out on four months and we're going into a deficit. Apparently, if we can reduce this date by four and a half days every year, by 2050, we will be back on track with using the resources the Earth can provide us at a sustainable rate that can be replenished. A lot of design ideology out there that's currently being used by people is a lot of greenwashing. Greenwashing meaning making a green product seem green, but really it's just as bad as the normal equivalent of it. It's more than just making the less bad product, but making one that actually is more sustainable. As a person born in the 90s, I will still be alive when these days are going on and we're constantly going to deficit. So, sustainability is a core issue to all industries that are polluting the environment, especially fashion, the one I'm a part of. It's more than making the less bad product, but making one that will start to solve the problems we've created altogether. For example, as someone in the fashion industry, again, the most polluting with textiles, it's more than just saying, recycle your clothing. Because again, eventually this clothing will have a life that ends up in a landfill. It's starting to look at the origin of this clothing and saying, how can we make a fiber that can be constantly recycled and doesn't downgrade in quality? 
or thinking how can we take this clothing and it becomes something else to the user. Like, can it be planted? Can it become a tree eventually? You never know, right? So it's looking for these innovative design solutions to interrupt this cycle and make it into a loop. As a closing note, it's nice to be virtually at camp. I miss the unlimited hot chocolate and I hope everyone is having a great time.